people like Sarah Blakely, who started Spanx. Yes. She lives close to her office, but she takes a fake commute to the office. She drives around in a car for an hour every morning. Why? Because she gets her breakthrough ideas doing it. Got it. If we were to sit down with Sarah Blakely and she would say, well, the key to success is to go drive around in your car for an hour. <laughs> would right. she do it? Like maybe. Probably not. Everyone has their own success formula and we've all come up with it ourselves. So that's what you mean by wealth is an inside job. Hey guys, welcome to episode number 95 of the Game on Girlfriend podcast. If you've never seen me before, hi, my name is Sarah Walton and I am on a mission to put more money in the hands of more women. Today's guest on the podcast is another woman who I consider a comrade in arms. This woman, I will stand shoulder to shoulder with her as we help transform our relationship to money, as women especially, but for all people, because money, like it or not, is the most powerful tool that we have access to. And in today's episode, Michelle arpin Bagina and I sat down and had one of the most honest conversations about money I've ever had. And I really hope you listen in for Michelle's transparency. I mean, here she is, this extraordinary financial, I want to say almost financial therapist. I know that's not technically her title because Michelle is an advisor, an author, and a speaker, but I'm going to call her a therapist too. I think that fits. You guys, her experience as a child growing up and watching money and how it was being handled isn't something I think most people went through but the experience of it, the feelings that came with it, like the response in her body and how she handled it and how it shaped her view of the world is something I think most of us can relate to, right? Because how many of us had parents with exquisite relationships to money? Yeah, that deafening silence, not that many, right? Like not many of us were walking around going, yeah, my mom's got it together about money or my dad, genius, right? very rare. And if that was your case, oh my gosh, good on you. That's fantastic. I hope you spread that around and share it with as many people as you can, because it is rare, right? So honor that. But for most of us, that wasn't the experience. And Michelle really shares her childhood experiences, what she really saw, what she heard, what she experienced, and, and how she's turned that into gold, quite frankly, for her clients and customers now. So in today's episode, what I really hope you listen for is the truth. I want you to listen for where you feel the same way that the two of us talk about feeling, right? Because I'm really honest in this interview as well. And I talk about the times I've been scared or what's happened in this response that we can have to money. And Michelle really gives us some concrete ways to deal with those moments, how we can work through them. And then she also offers a free gift to us, which you will find the link for underneath this video. All right, so I think we swear. So you might wanna pop in those earphones in case you have little ones running around and let's get to it. Michelle, welcome to the Game on Girlfriend podcast. I'm thrilled you're here with us today. And I gotta tell you, I cannot wait to dive in on this topic. It is so near and dear in my heart and I'm glad to have an expert here today. I am so thrilled to be here and to talk, you know, truth about money and sharing from the heart. Well, I'm game for that. So, okay. If we're going to start with sharing from this, the heart, right. Can we please talk about a moment? <laughs> you were 17 years old. You're sitting on a bench, looking out at the water and your father says to you, I don't have the money to send you to school. And why did he not have the money to send you to school? Well, uh, after being groomed and raised, you're, you'll be the first to go to college. You're smart. Uh, every indication was, we'll send you off to four-year school. Um, my father even took me in college campus tours. Uh, when I, the spring of my senior year of high school, my parents decided to buy a yacht. And without telling me, that was the money that was meant to go toward paying my college tuition. So in essence, when he said, I just a shrug of the shoulders and kind of that aw shucks boyish grin of his was like, I don't have the money to send you to college, but it's basically code for you are on your own, babe. <laughs> okay, the story's not a surprise. I've read it, right? But I was like, what do you, 
Hmm. You are clearly a woman who is determined. You are strong. You know what you want. You know you're capable. And yet in that moment at 17 years old, what did you experience? Like, I'm a big believer in like, what did you experience in your body? Like what Mm -hmm. happened for you in that moment, both the fight and the determination of like, okay, well, I'll figure that out. But also the betrayal, right? The the Mm -hmm. shock of like, but you said, wait, how did that go for you? Like for real? Yeah. First of all, Sarah, you're the first person to ever ask me that question. And there was something very physical that went on and so many layers. So there's, there's so many things I can unpack here. I was in complete shock. Yeah. And the way I describe how I felt, it was as if my internal organs had turned chalk white instantly. Oh, I just got chills. Yeah. And what I now look back and realize was it actually created an energetic break between my parents and I in that moment that I then spent decades trying to pretend didn't exist, which was very painful. And it's that journey of holding out for the perfect parents that never come. And then you finally realize like they're imperfect beings. And then you, once you accept the forgiveness kind of comes, not kind of, it does, it does come. But um, you know, the expression when there's a will, there's a way. Yes. The will is the way. Mm. Oh, I felt and that. Yeah. We don't often think about, we hear strong will, we hear good will, but we don't hear about skilled will and transpersonal will. And I think what was really in play for me at that moment, because when I literally was standing on the dock, I was looking my father in his eyes and I did not react. Now, as honestly, I think back on it and how I didn't throw him off the dock into the water <laughs> is beyond me. If it happened now, I totally would do that. Then I was too reserved. Well, and, I think you were probably um, also in shock. Like, let's be nice to pass Michelle. I'm sure that was a stunning moment for you of just, I'm it, sorry, it what? really was. Yeah. I, I was totally in shock, but my mind immediately started racing. Mm. And here were my thoughts. College costs a lot of money. I don't have any money. How am I going to get money? Okay, I got to work. Where am I going to work? I just went into like, how am I going to get this done? Because again, I was groomed basically at that moment. I was a college graduate in waiting, right? I had parents who told me you can be anything you want to be. Mm. I had parents who told me you'll go to college. You're the smart one. You'll be the first in the family to go. So in my young life, it was a foregone conclusion that that was going to happen. It was something I was passionate about because I love to learn, mm. but it was also something that I had took on as my identity. Yes. That's why it was unshakable. And in fact, my favorite word to describe it is I was indomitable because I had that identity and you can't shake loose somebody's identity. We get to shape that. Going back to the will for a second, the transpersonal will is when something is much larger than yourself and you're willing to step into that. And that's how I always saw my education or at least in that moment I did. And I believe out of those elements of the will, that's what propelled me forward in that moment. And because I am a believer that we all are connected to the universe, I left that dock that day and had no visibility on how I actually was going to get that done. Yeah. I started working for a bank in the fall and they asked me to take a course that reimbursed college tuition. Ding, 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 ding. Oh my gosh. That's incredible. Isn't that like, I had no idea that I believe in the universe. And then you went about a job that made it all reimbursable. That's incredible. <clears throat> what a testament to that. Exactly. I couldn't have dreamt up, okay, I'm going to find a job that's going to have college tuition reimbursement benefits. I didn't even know what those were. You probably didn't even know that existed, right? I had no idea. Yeah. So what are the odds that that would happen? I would say, I mean, the odds of that happening are pretty slim, except that you did have what I call confidence and I call confidence, just the belief in yourself to figure it out. Like that's what confidence is, right? I always joke around, like have, 
walk around with the confidence of a mediocre white man, right? Because they're like, dude, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that, and I'm gonna figure out how to get it, right? And it's like, if we all walked around like that, what would be possible? And like, I know I crack jokes, but like, that's literally what you did. Like you were stunned, right? The, and life hands us these moments, Michelle. And I love the way that you described it. And I'm sorry, nobody's ever asked you about that. Cause to me, that's where the magic is, right? That's the human moment of like, oh my God, life just happened to me, <laughs> right? It was going this way. And then now it's going that way. And nobody told me. And you got up off the bench. I love how you described that. You literally got up off the bench and said, well, I've decided this is a foregone conclusion, so I'm going to go make it happen. And you did. Thank you. I, I think I also subconsciously in that moment also made a choice that, um, you know, for your listeners, listen, your parents buying a yacht might not feel very relatable, right? Not most people like it to go right around a yacht. And that, you know, yeah. I, and yes, I did actually get, get on the boat. But what might be relatable is the history behind that is my parents were what I call high performance defiant. And what I mean by that is that expression, how you do one thing is how you do everything. I don't believe that's true. Yes. My parents were hard working, honest people, fun loving, and they were good people. They were a hot mess when it came to their money. They just had this one area of life that they really couldn't get it together. And in fact, I remember money was an open secret in my house. I mean, they were really open about this stuff. Like, uh, let's just say that a lot of information was shared with me as a kid that was way ahead of my time and stuff that I look back on now. And I have my own children that I would never dream of telling my 10 year old the same things that I heard at that time. Was it categories of things, Michelle? Like there were certain categories of money that you feel children, probably it's just not appropriate for them to know about it. Or was it more about the specifics for you that sort of had you realize later, like, whoa, maybe that wasn't a conversation I should have heard. Yeah, I think it's two things. I think it is the specifics. When specifics are shared by a parent as a way to relieve their own stress around money, that's when it's inappropriate. And that's Got it. That was what my experience was. It was a lot of instability, a lot of stress. And, you know, we're talking private airplanes and you name the sports car, we had it. But the dirty little secret was my parents were down to their last $5 every single time they made these really big ticket purchases. So from the outside looking in, it looked like something that it wasn't. Like, you know, that imposter syndrome that we all fear? Yes. Yes. I lived it. I really lived it. I felt like a fraud. I felt like an imposter. I was, you know, I was put out there like an accessory of my perfect family, you know? So I come by all this interest really, really honestly. And by the same token, my parents also instilled certain beliefs about what I was capable of. And that's what carried me actually, is that I kind of subconsciously looked at the situation and was like, yeah, but you said I can go do and be anything. So I'm going to go do that. But I also in that moment, and I don't think I realized it at the time, but looking back, as you can imagine, I've reflected on this many, many times. Yes. <laughs> yes. It takes a lot to unpack that bag. Um, but what I also realized was that in that moment, I also was making a choice of those are the choices you're making in your financial life. They are not going to be mine. Got it. This is how you run your financial life, how I've, uh, what I've observed, uh, that, that's not how it's going to be for me. I did not want to live in a constant state of financial insecurity. You know, when you're down to your last $5, whether it's a car or your parents just bought a pack of cigarettes and now no one has any money, it, that is not a fun place to be. You know, in fact, that's like our biggest fear is to not have any money. No, it's terrifying. And yeah. I, I talk a lot about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And that that safety is like the bottom rung of the pyramid. Like, and when you don't feel safe and financially safe, the way our world is structured right now, I mean, that's at the top of almost everyone's mind. So it's so amazing how life delivers certain things to us, right? <laughs> it's like here you were living 
in what I'm assuming most of your clients come to you with, which is this moment of like absolute terror. And I use the word terror because it's like, I don't, I can't see tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen. Like, oh dear God, what am I doing? I don't know how to not feel this way because I've been on this treadmill forever. And so for you to see that as the models of adulthood, when you were a child, I mean, that must have just really, I think what you've done with it is so amazing. You've absolutely turned it into gold. And I know you've said that about it, but I truly believe you have because we've been given these experiences and, you know, we kind of have two choices. We can sit back and go, well, I guess life's just this way. I must suck. And this is the way it's going to be. Or you flip it around, like you said, and say, absolutely not for me. That is not the way this is going for me. I'm going to get up and make this different. Right. There's a lot of times we run into experts who really love a certain subject or they want to empower people in a certain subject, but we get that feeling like, do you know what I feel? (laughs) Like, do you know how terrified I am about money? Do you know how much I don't know what I'm doing right now? And to have somebody who's really gone through it like that, Michelle, I think it's a really special position you're in. And I think it's very cool. Thank you. So I just had to say that because there's a lot of times, you know, my job is to help women use their talents and gifts and expertise to make the world a better place. And it's so cool to watch somebody do that, right? (laughs) To like deal with what you had to deal with your parents, learn what you had to learn about money, find the money to go to school. Like all those things, those are like real life on the daily tasks that you had to work through Mm -hmm. to cause this career that you have to have. And I think it's, it's very cool to see. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you know what? I, I hope we all, and I've had this experience of literally working with other people who have helped me that I have said, thank you for going through what you went through so that you could help me get there faster. Absolutely. Hopefully we all get that experience, but I've, I've been the beneficiary of it too. That's really kind for you to say. And you know what? I wouldn't change a moment of my journey as much as it, it was, it was not easy. Um, but it, I think the challenges sometimes point to the purpose. So Mm -hmm. I was getting very loud and clear messages. This is your lane, go get in it. And you know, something you said earlier about Maslow, I I love, you know, hierarchy of needs. Yes. So what I'm really up to is helping people transcend their money beliefs. And I use that word transcend on purpose because like using our money for a purpose that's higher than ourselves, I think is really important. And I think that's a part of the purpose of money. And that can be anything from giving money to a charity or a person that you believe in, Mm -hmm. or, and I know for a lot of your audience, it can also be transcending money beliefs so that you're financially stable to do the work you are meant to be doing in the world. Yes. Right. Absolutely. And the reason I use transcend is the top of the pyramid, I used to always think was self-actualization. And in the last couple of years, it's come out that before Maslow died, he amended the top of the pyramid, which he didn't even create the pyramid. It was somebody else who created it, but we all think of it that way. Right. But he amended it where he had realized he was combining self-actualization and self-transcendence as if they were the same experience. And he realized self-transcendence is the highest order of needs. And that's where it's, um, you are connected to the world and their transformational process. And you are using your talents and gifts. And that's where, you know, mystical experiences that people have, that all comes to play. He started talking about that before he passed, but it, it, he didn't live long enough to popularize it and let us all know it. But I very specifically chose to talk about my work as transcending money beliefs because it is beyond self-actualizing. That's very cool. And transcending meaning breaking through all the way, right? Like just absolutely turning it into gold and moving through it. And that's what you mean by that. Yeah. Yeah. And how it applies to people's lives, right? In, in a, in a, in, in the ways that it applies to their lives, right? It's not something for anyone else to define, but we're all looking to transcend something or many somethings. And I think it's really about getting clear on what is the purpose that money serves in your life, right? Because our lives are underwritten by money and really connecting those dots. It's very cool. 
Well, I think that brings us to something that, that you do really well, which is helping people actually understand their success formula, right? So it would be, I'm sure part of, of understanding your success formula is looking at what you do need to transcend in order to feel more comfortable. Am I, I'm totally guessing, but am I right about that? Is that part of your success formula? Yes. And I think also an appreciation for what has already been transcended. So you know how we're told, um, look for clues, right? Success leaves clues. Yes. And it's this time honored thing to talk to someone who has pursued a path that you're interested in, learn what they did and maybe emulate them. Right. Mm -hmm. But then I think of people like Sarah Blakely, who started Spanx. Yes. Right. Okay. And one of the things that she does is she lives close to her office, but she takes a fake commute to the office. She drives around in a car for an hour every morning. Why? Because she gets her breakthrough ideas doing it, doing that. Got it. So <clears throat> if we were to sit down with Sarah Blakely and she would say, well, the key to success is to go drive around in your car for an hour. <laughs> would right. you do it? Like maybe. So my point is that everyone has their own success formula and we've all come up with it ourselves. So what I'm a big proponent of is, and again, I'm going to go back to high performance defiance because it links to that, is that we can have it all going on, have everything all together, but money is like, eh, not so much. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be as extreme as my parents. It could also be, I have it going on with my money. I just don't feel as confident about it as I would like to. And I'm not sure I have it all going on. So it could also be in that category, right? It doesn't mean that you're doing what my parents did. Right, right. So that's what you mean by wealth is an inside job, right? Like it's actually your experience of working through your money issues or your experience of handling your money um, and making sure that that's working well. Does that, is that accurate? Yes. And that's like the mechanics of it. When I say the inside job of money, right? Like what's inside that counts is what my mom used to always say. What I mean by that is really discovering what are your beliefs around money? Where did they come from? What were the lightning rod moments growing up as a kid that you made meaning of? Because let's think, right? We all know this now that we go from feeling to thinking, right? When we're born, we don't think, we feel, and then we think. Right. So we experience things in our body first, and then we develop the cognitive abilities to reason and to understand. Well, when you're four, you're five, or you're seven, and you can think back to money memories or money experiences, right? You're starting to gain an awareness, but your knowledge is extremely, your academic knowledge is extremely limited to really make sense of it, not to mention understanding the dynamics of relationships that might have been played or even the larger system that you were a part of, right? The family, the school system, the world, you know, the cultural systems. We're, we're not equipped at five, seven, 10 years old to really understand that. Nor are we ever taught to take the little trip down memory lane and examine it. Great, yeah. Right, so here's how you examine it as an adult. What did you hear growing up? And I'll, I'll tell you a story about that. What did you hear growing up, okay? What were the watershed or milestone moments? We all have a few financial moments growing up. Were they positive, were they negative? What did we make them mean, right? Looking at these things through the eyes of an adult gives us a completely fresh perspective. When we can think back and then ask ourselves, what did that mean to me when I was, you know, seven or 10 or what have you? What were the dynamics? What do I now know that I didn't know then, right? Because there's lots of parts that were left out. Somebody that I know, <clears throat> he did this as an adult and what he heard again as an adult was his father's voice, which growing up he heard money isn't important. Got it. Well, <clears throat> this client was five years out of uh, his first job as an investment banker, 
working a ton, making great money, and he had a thousand dollars to his name. Right. And when he heard that, he realized I took on that belief because if money isn't important, I'm going to spend it all. Hence, I have a thousand bucks. Right. 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 No, that makes complete sense. So, step number one to really understanding this is I love that. So, what did I hear growing up about money? Yep. Does yep. that, is that the same as what did I see? Because like you said, I think your parents were super open with you, but I know a lot of people, I didn't even know money existed. Like, I don't know like, what they were doing with money right. or not doing with money. I just know we never had it. Right. So is it also what we saw as children as well as what we heard? Good point. Yes. What did you hear? What did you see? Right. Got it. Were there discrepancies, right? Do as I say, not as I oh, do as I say, not one. as I do. Yes. yes. It was, yeah. it's all of that. Right. Yeah. It also was who were the close family, friends, or family members? What were their attitudes around money? What did they say? What was it like at school? What was your experience versus people who had more or less than you did? What did all of that mean to you? What were your, did your family ever have any expressions around people who did have money or didn't have money? Uh, socially, right? Because we all socially compare were there moments of keeping up with the Joneses, not from a material aspect, but also right. from wanting to fit in aspects, right? Oh, we're not, you know, let's keep that really quiet. Like we don't want anyone to know that. Totally. Right? It's, yeah. yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. There is. And I think that fitting in one, I think you really hit on something important because I know anytime we study psychology, right? Human psychology and understanding what really drives us not being cut out from the tribe, <laughs> like that was a life or death thing for us, for all of our ancestors, right? You got cut out from the tribe. You probably died, yeah. right? So I think that's taken on that new form in our society now. Like, don't tell people we can't afford this house or this car or the membership or the, the new shoes or whatever the heck it is that we're all trying to fit into now. And seeing that as a child to watch adults, because the message there is we're not okay unless we have these right, things, right? We don't tell anybody. Yes. Right. And that's, I think that's really challenging as a child to see adults who are supposed to be like the end all be all they've got to figure it out. They're grown ups, right? Like all that stuff we think when we're little, it's scary. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, fMRI brain scans actually prove to your point that we feel money exactly like a life or death situation. I believe that a hundred percent. I because yeah. yeah. I've experienced it, right? Of like, yep. oh my God. Yeah. 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 I've had those moments. I know that instant moment where you're doing that, oh my God, and your brain literally is hijacked. Like you, you've got nothing going on that's rational. And you, I, I'll speak for myself. I will think of the most extreme mm. black swan thing that could possibly happen in that instant moment of, shock and being hijacked it's terrible and then I, at least i'm old enough to now know like oh okay calm down i mean one of the best cures around money is that old sleep on it right give yourself the distance of whatever you know any any financial moment that you're experiencing something like that the first thing is to sleep on it like to really to give yourself the distance of the of time, even it is amazing, really, even a couple of hours, sometimes even 10 minutes can just let you separate yourself from the event that's occurring so that you then can ask the logical questions of, is that true? Is that not true? What am I telling myself? What am I feeling to your point? Like, this is my rumbling process in life but especially when it comes to money, like this is, and I'll start writing pen to paper. Like, what am I feeling? What am I worried about the other person's gonna say to me if it's some kind of negotiation? Again, the belonging thing. And I love what you said about taking a minute because I don't know about you, but like, if I have a moment of like <gasps> around money, <laughs> like whatever it is, whether something didn't come in, I thought it would, or I paid for something and I was like, oh crap, that I messed that up or whatever happens. I feel, and I'm sure it's the fight or flight response. <laughs> it's that response in us. Like you said, it hijacks the brain, yep. but I get this unbelievable urge to act like right now, like five seconds ago, start acting. And I'm so happy that you said that because every single time I've personally stepped back and been like, dude, breathe, it's going to be fine. Everything's work out about like, it's all okay. Right. It right. feels so much better, but that moment 
the instinct is to run and fix it as fast as possible, right? I mean, it's amazing. I love that you said hijack. Well, bringing it back to what you said earlier is that we feel like a life or death situation. Well, when we're in a real life or death situation, run. That's right. You're going to be killed. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I, for a long, long time, I did not buy into the notion of, you know, our bodies are still in prehistoric times when our, we live in this modern world. Uh, I, I have since turned that around to accept that I do believe that that is the truth. <laughs> we got some DNA hanging out in there, running yeah, around. I've been hijacked yeah. way too many times now to, <laughs> to dispute that. I know. It'd be nice if we could though, right? I don't need to be part of a tribe. I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's still in there, I think. And this brings me to something really interesting. This is the one thing that um, I really wanted to talk to you about today because I, I talk a lot about how we're not compartmentalized, right? And like you said, how we do one thing is how we do everything. But I think the other thing that can happen is when we start to get focused and our careers really start to take off and we really start to lean into this new level of success, the rest of your life can sometimes fall apart. I think you say it nicer than that. You say, what do you do when you feel successful? But it's not quite aligned with the rest of your life. You're much more diplomatic than me. I'm like, the rest of it falls apart. And you're like, oh, crap. So can you talk about that? Like, what do you think is at work when that happens for us? And what do we do to work through it? Well, I think what you're talking about is if we think about systems, right? So in any system, everyone plays a role, right? So let's just talk about a family, for example. And let's say that she's the breadwinner, he's at home with the kids and she wants to leave the breadwinning job and start her own consultancy, which comes with some risk of, I now have to create an income to support the family. Well, the system may not love that idea because now you're changing status quo. And maybe the husband has to go back to work or not, or the wife, or they say, no, this is the system that we've set up. We want to maintain this, right? So it's, <clears throat> there's always a positive and the negative to anytime we make any type of a change, there's always an ancillary benefit or benefits that we never saw coming just by changing one thing. And the opposite is true too. Every time that we make a change within our system, it's uh, completely necessary that something in our system is going to change because we did. So it's just what happens. There's a natural fallout, right? It's the, it's the process of change. And I do want to go back to something in the success formula because I'm not sure to close that loop, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> Which I'm, I'm famous for going off in these tangents and then realizing later, like, Oh, I really should have said this. Yeah, well, welcome to the club. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm not the only one. The point of the success formula is to actually look back on your own successes. Okay. Look back on three, four, five of them, however many you want. And they don't have to be financial. It can be financial or non-financial successes. Okay. But pick things that took time, right? It's not an overnight success, something that was gritty, something that took some fortitude and conviction and took some time where you had to navigate a path to get from point A to point B. Okay. Got it. And what I guide people through is to look at where was hero in effect, hope, optimism, resilience, and efficacy. Okay. Okay. Where was that in effect? To look at positive financial psychology, which the short acronym there is PERMA, positive emotions, in, uh, engagement or flow, okay. relationships, meaning, and success or accomplishment, P-E-R-M-A. Okay. 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 Got it. I got it. Yeah. <clears throat> When you look back and you trace the roots of any success that you've had in your life, you will find those elements in any success. And you'll also tap into the natural resilient strategies that you used when things didn't go well, when you had to slug it out and you thought, it's never going to work. Well, what did you do to get yourself to keep going, right? Like somebody that I took, this, took the, them through this process she realized how much she relied on positive self-talk, which, okay, shrug of the shoulders, positive self-talk. Okay. Okay. The point was she realized how much she relied on it. I see. 
that's a part of her secret sauce. That's what works for her versus somebody else who maybe calls a coach and relies on the coach or uses affirmations or hypnosis or meditation or whatever they use to continue or setting reminders for themselves, right? Right. That's the whole point is to tap into what have you already done naturally and what have you already figured out for yourself? Because I know for a fact that you can take all of those elements and map them onto your money. You can use the same tools. That makes sense to me. Cause it's like, I know, like I, I run quarterly sprints with my students where they pick one goal for a quarter and they sprint towards it. So smart. And what I found is we do this whole, I have a kind of a unique goal setting formula that they have to go through. And it's very similar to what you just said. I'm like, if it doesn't light you up, if you're not emotionally attached to it, right? Like all the things you just said, like other relationships will be affected. Like if all that stuff isn't in there, it's not going to work. Right. And so I could see applying that to money, especially because money is such a fear-based, it can cause such a fear-based response in us, like we were saying, fight or flight and life or death, right? Yeah. That to add those elements in would be incredibly powerful. I must imagine, like, like as you say, wealth is an inside job, but that transformation has got to be extraordinary to observe in people. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Very- it's the difference between... It's not that um, fight or flight response to act. It's the more powerful observation of somebody stepping into, they actually believe that they can make their mind's eye vision come to fruition. I love it. That's it's the power. It's the, it's the self-belief, like, like we talk about, right? Mm-hmm. And the power to envision yeah. it and hold on to that vision. Like you did yes. off, the park, off the park bench. <laughs> yeah. there, um, and I find, I mean, yeah, yeah. personally, I find that to be the hardest thing mm. to, how do you keep that vision front and center? Yeah. To me, that's the trick. That's one of the tricks is keeping that in the forefront, right? In the, in the you know, literally in your line of vision, however you do that. And I, I think it's different how each of us find effective ways to do that. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. And I think that goes, but that also goes to your success formula, right? Of like looking back at your past success, looking back at what you've done and you can see what works for you, right? And for some people, self-taught coach, for me, it's running. Like we all have our things, right? Of like, where do we go? How do we do this? How do we work through that? And pulling on that and and using it when it works. Um, Is there more to the success formula? Because I don't want to leave that out. (laughs) because <laughs> you're you and I could talk forever I know are there are there those are the gold sources? those are the big gold the nuggets okay okay so what did you hear what did you see right and yes yeah. oh no no six okay no sorry let me let me separate the yep. success formula does not do that trip down memory lane okay of what did you what did you hear growing up what did you experience what did you say okay that I don't even cover that in the success formula. In the in the success formula, it's literally looking at positive psych, uh, psychology okay. and psychological capital. So an element I didn't mention: psychological capital is what you know, who you know, what you have, and who you're being. Love that last one. Those four elements. So we always think, right? It's not what you know; it's who you know. Well, there's two other elements to it, and the who you're being. Okay, I'll give you like, this is a little bit embarrassing, but oh, I on. summon my inner Aaron Brockovich. Oh, That's let's do my, it. who I'm being. Okay, so she is fierce, mm. friendly, and she's an advocate. So when I need to be a fierce, friendly advocate, I'm like, Aaron, come with me. I need you. And that's when I have to step into something that scares me Mm. Uh, I call them be the change kind of a moments. Like you and I are both in New Jersey. I'll give you one example. So, you know, be the change in the world you want to see. Yeah. Well, okay. And you, you're an entrepreneur. You work with entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs have be the change moments all the time. Absolutely. And I think, that, that, right. It's you literally embody being the change you want to see in the world. Right. But those moments where you get that harebrained idea and you instantly like swat it away and you go, oh, that's too crazy. Like I could never do that. That's too big. Or any of the other, you know, garbage chatter that we have going on. <laughs> yeah. That's, those are the 
be the change kind of moment. So a couple of years ago, I was rereading the financial literacy standards for the state of New Jersey. Okay. Keyword geek rereading. Okay. <laughs> or brilliant woman studying her craft. Yes. Right. Go ahead. Okay. I'll go with the latter. <laughs> Thank you. You bet. And I just, for whatever reason, I, I was, tra- something sparked me to read it. And you know, when you you look at something with a fresh set of eyes and see something that was there, but you didn't see it the first time? Totally. So I had one of those moments. And so I'm reading this description of the K through 12 program that exists as a mandate in the state for okay. financial literacy. And what I saw was financial psychology and behavioral economics were not part of the curriculum. And my brain went, hmm, what would that look like if it were? And how would I get that done? And hmm, hmm who's in charge? Who's in charge of the board of that that I got to go talk to? <laughs> and then, who are you kidding? Like, how are you going to get? Okay. So I swatted all that away. The long story short is the timing was perfect. New Jersey was forming committees every five years. We relook at the learning standards in every subject. And I got invited to be on the committee. And as a matter of fact, New Jersey is the first state in the union as of September of 2021 to now include financial psychology and behavioral econ in our standards. Oh my gosh, that's extraordinary, Michelle. That's incredible. I didn't even know that. That's amazing. Well, it's like the best kept secret in New Jersey. Oh my, can we advertise that somewhere? That needs to be on billboards (laughs) or something. Like that is extraordinary because not understanding the money, which is one of the reasons I was so excited to bring you on the show, because not understanding money is like the most brutal way to go through life because it's the most you know, influential tool we have access to. It's the most powerful tool we have access to and we all have access Mm -hmm. to it. But if we mismanage it or we don't understand how it could work for us, it's incredibly damaging. That is extraordinary. I'm so impressed. Like I'm like actually kind of stunned right now. That's wonderful news. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. The the point isn't that I accomplished it. The point is that I had a be the change moment a little bit the point for me well thank you it was the be the change moment yes right and that's what i think we're doing entrepreneurs are doing and it's what we do to make our mind's eye vision become a reality Mm -hmm. is that we have to contend with that oh this is a really really great idea i'm super excited about it and then in the same moment like who do you think you are Yes. To, you can't do that. That's right. That's not how you weren't raised that way. That's not how it's been. You know, all that, all that stuff. Yeah. I call that voice Scarlet. And to anybody named Scarlet, I'm so sorry. I don't know why I name it Scarlet, but it's the mean, it's, she's the mean one, right? I mean, she's like mean, she's totally mean. Yeah. Um, and it's like, why would we listen to the attacking voice, right? It's like, if you were to walk into mm. a store and one of the salespeople was like, well, you look like crap. I don't know how you're doing. Like, you're not going to go work with that salesperson. You'll work with the nice one. He goes, hi, how can I help you today? But instead mm. in our brains, we listen to the mean lady all the time. And I don't know what that's about, but I'm out to change that. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Well, Michelle, I think we could probably talk for another three and a half hours. Um, but (laughs) we are out of time today and I want to make sure I give you enough time. I believe you have a special gift for all of our listeners today. Is that true? I do. I do. So your listeners can find me on, uh, my website. That's the best place. Michelleab.com. It's Michelle with two L's. Got it. And right on my homepage is the success formula guide that they can download and work through lots of the stuff that we've talked about today. Wonderful. All right. We will make sure for those of you watching on YouTube, that link will be under the video here. And for those of you listening on the podcast, it will be in the show notes. So make sure you grab it along with all of Michelle's social media links and her link to her website. So make sure you guys check that out, Michelle. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I think there's so much for us to learn and think about and experience um, having had you on the show. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Sarah. 